Well, greetings out there in YouTube land and welcome to today's video which features the second amp that was sent to us by Big Dave. This particular jewel is the Less Man Echo Amp. Okay, ideally named uh, for this period of such complex gender identity. Um, also, a brand that I've never heard of. I think they're associated with accordions or something of that sort, which some really great amps were. So I've got it outside here so we can get a really good idea of what it looks like to begin with. Looks like it's in great shape, but uh, very soiled. It's also very windy today, and uh, I really can't wait to take it apart and see what's going on inside. It has a 3 amp fuse, so I have a feeling it's a fairly powerful uh, circuit. So let's drag it into the workshop and see what we got. And here it is, perched proudly atop the workbench. It's a hefty beast, uh, and I only hope that its quality will justify the hernias that I uh, received while putting it up here. Okay, let's pull the back and take a look. Well, the back door came off easily. It looks like somebody's installed a toggle switch in here for reasons that are probably best left unknown. Um, now let's take a look inside at the circuit, which when lit up is surprisingly simple for an amplifier of this size. Um, this is a mysterious device here. It may be a transformer uh, or uh, some sort of uh, can capacitor going to have to check closely to figure that out. We see that it's been worked on. There's some new caps here, which makes me nervous since I don't have a schematic for this. Uh, so I uh, am not going to really be able to tell if anything's been changed. Okay, I'm just going to have to hope that uh, whoever did work on it uh, put things in in the right place. Uh, this explains the hole in that upper Mac door. It's an auxiliary input. You can see that one side of it's grounded, the shield side, and the other side goes right to the uh, grid of the, I'm going to guess, 12AX7 tube that would plug in under here. This is a nice touch, November 12th, 1963. That doesn't leave much doubt about when this chassis was made. And I find the controls on top to be quite interesting. Let's just go down the line. Uh, the 3 amp fuse seems rather large to me a nice blue pilot light and then the mysterious term echo amp okay we see speed and echo now when I see speed I'm thinking tremolo now look here on the echo it's got a three position switch normal which I guess is echo off VIB and trem uh, could the VIB possibly be vibrato and tremolo and one amp I guess we're going to have to do some checking to see. Regular volume, and then there is an external speaker volume, which is sort of unusual, um, and uh, we'll have to investigate that. I see one other hole here up on top that doesn't make much sense to me. I'm not sure why it's there, but it's been there a long time. We'll have to pull a chassis to see. Okay, inside. Uh, we have what looks to me like a replacement speaker. If this thing was made in 63, uh, this is probably an eminent speaker. The uh, prefix is EM. Uh, let's check uh, for numbers on it and see if we can figure out any more about it. Sure enough, when we look inside, we see that uh, the prefix for the uh, part number is a 67, which is eminent. But I've got to say that the overall appearance and cleanliness uh, make me think it's probably a replacement. It is an Alnico replacement, so that's nice. And we'll just have to take a look at the cone and listen to it and see if it's up to our standard. Let's take another look down here. I see something else that might be interesting. And it says uh, Lessman Corporation Electronic Instruments. Echo amp number 3157. Okay, not much help to me really, but uh, at least that it's there. And I like labels like this to be intact. 
Okay, I'm not sure what that is. Maybe some extra fuses or something like that, like they did in Velco amps. There is no sign that there ever was a reverb uh, tank of any sort uh, built into this, so we know darn well that when they talk about echo, it must be uh, either tremolo or vibrato or hopefully both, uh, but reverb is just not uh, part of the, the fun here. Something else that's a little surprising is the speaker here in the cabinet is not connected to the chassis. Uh, which makes me think this unit has probably been used as a remote speaker. Speaker in the cabinet and then plugged in to an amplifier of some sort and uh, really the circuit of it has not been used in a long time. That's just a guess but why else would you have no connections between the circuit and the speaker? And God forbid that these be the original speaker leads twisted together which would make for a lot of fun. Uh, I bet they are. Uh, Going to have to do some checking on this. Okay, wouldn't it be nice to have a schematic? Uh, also, there's something else here I just noticed. Look at the back. There's a grommet back there for a wire of some sort to exit uh, from the chassis. And uh, God only knows what it is or, or what it was for because over here we have the power cord on the left side, frayed and wretched as it may be. Okay, so this uh, beast is, uh, has all sorts of interesting little quirks that should be fun to figure out. So let's pull a chassis and get started on it. Well, I got the chassis out. There's only two screws holding it in, and I'm astounded by the very large and uh, robust power transformer that it has. And this little bracket right here on the power transformer answers a question from earlier. And that is, what is this extra hole back here doing? And what it was, of course, is, is there was a screw through there that would go through this bracket and keep that heavy power transformer from drooping. All right, going down the line, we have that monster uh, power transformer. Uh, this, I believe, is a filter choke because there's only two wires coming out of it. And this is a good size output transformer. And those really were the leads for the speaker that were sticking out that we saw just a few minutes ago. The rest of the chassis is nice and clean. And looking at the bottom of the chassis, we see that the uh, tube sockets are clearly marked 12AX7, 12AU7, the 6V6 output tubes, 12AX7, and a 5Y3 rectifier. So we sit down here, we see that the uh, probably aluminum uh, control panel is laminated onto the surface of the uh, steel chassis. And rather than drill holes through that aluminum panel, they cut the corners off. If anybody can figure out the advantage of that, let me know because I can't, I can't figure it. Okay, we've already looked at the controls. And now it's time to flip this jewel over and take a close-up look at the circuitry. And looking in here uh, to the chassis, we see shades of high watt where they're bending the uh, wires at right angles instead of just draping them across, which is kind of nice. Up here is that mysterious echo switch, which uh, we're going to have to figure out what that VIB means. Okay, and then this, which may be some sort of line matching transformer. Whatever it is, though, it's original because both the bracket and it are soldered in with really old looking solder. Okay, so let's see if we can get this out or loose to where we can read what's on top of it and try to figure out what its purpose is. You know, I was just getting ready to cut this uh, input jack. And then it occurred to me, what's missing on this thing? There are no input jacks anywhere on it, okay? Nowhere. Uh, that's it. So apparently, originally, you plugged into the input jack that came through that upper back door. Very strange. Uh, since this isn't a priceless uh, collectible, I'm very tempted to put in a one or two input jacks up on the control panel where they're uh, easily accessible. 
And the more I look at this hole that is cut in the back door, uh, it looks rather crude and also rather recent. Uh, I do not believe that that was original. Uh, I think that that input jack um, has been added on to this device and that it actually had no input jack at all as it left the factory. Uh, perhaps it was hardwired with a roll of cable in the bottom and a jack of some sort that you plugged into a companion uh, piece of equipment which is long gone. Uh, but anyway, I know darn well that that uh, input jack that we just looked at uh, is not original and that this hole and it were just tacked on uh, to this chassis. And then talk about a frayed power cord. Uh, I'm going to wait till the 4th of July to plug this thing in, I think. Actually, what I'm going to do is just cut it off. This is a disaster waiting to happen. But God love them, this wretched cord as the underwriter's lab inspection seal. Okay, quick review. Remove the uh, input jack. Remove the speaker jack. Removed a little homemade uh, hook that was inside in here probably to hang the power cord on and remove that wretched butt underwriters lab approved power cord. Now let's uh, see if we can get a, a good look at what is written on this. Now I've twisted that mysterious object so we see it is a transformer. Um, it has uh, three separate windings and uh, Let's see, 25,000 ohms, is that what, 5 milliamps, 25,000 ohms, 3 milliamps, 600 ohms, 0 DC. Okay, I'm going to I'm gonna have to do some research on this to figure out what purpose this can serve. Let's have just a brief discussion here on why this uh, UTC line matching transformer is necessary. As you know, transformers serve the purpose with alternating current of increasing and decreasing voltage and current. So in this case my guess is that the original input was connected to two middle uh, terminals on the transformer. There's nothing co uh, connected there right now but there's solder and I think there were uh, wires connected to those two and I believe that was the input to this device uh, was through these two terminals. Now if the resistance of this coil is 600 ohms DC resistance isn't a good uh, way really to uh, give you exact winding ratios or impedance ratios but it can give you an idea of what they might be. Notice the tremendous uh, difference in the uh, y, uh, resistance of the secondary. So to me I believe that this device which is a UTC number G3441 uh, uh, line matching transformer is to take in a very weak signal probably from a transducer of some sort and it may have been in an accordion. Remember that this amp was used a lot with accordions. So imagine that you have transducers in your accordion. A wire then comes from the amplifier that is connected to these two terminals, plugs into the accordion, picks up that weak transducer signal, brings it into the amp and then steps it way up in voltage. Okay, like if we're going to just go by DC a resistance ratio is like 40 to 1. But we're going to then have a fairly high current low voltage input from our I'm thinking accordion and turning it into a much higher voltage lower current output from the secondary that is going to power our amplifier. Now granted it's just a guess but it's the best I can do. It also explains why there's no wires uh, that uh, look original that are connected to any sort of input. Okay, I think it was hardwired. I think that there was a cable that connected to these two points on that transformer that passed through that grommet at the rear of the chassis, went downstairs and was all coiled up in the bottom of the cabinet. When it came time to play your accordion, you uncoiled that 
and plug the quarter inch jack that was on the end of that cable into your accordion where it would pick up this, the weak signal from the transducers that were uh, located within the uh, accordion. Okay, that's my guess and I'm sticking to it. Alright, faced with a circuit like this to which there is no schematic that has a very unusual feature in that it has a three-way switch uh, for a uh, called echo uh, which includes both a tremolo and VIB whatever that may be here's what I advocate uh, I'm going to replace these probably bad Aerovox capacitors these are filter caps this one uh, I'm figuring is probably okay um, I believe that what we have here is a 12AX7 preamp a 12AU7 phase inverter, this two 6V6 output tubes, and I believe this 12AX7, if you look in here, is going to be the tremolo oscillator. If you look, there's three similarly sized caps in that oscillation circuit. Okay, that's probably all we really need to know about this. So let's replace these caps, hook this up to a speaker, plug it in, and see what happens. It may work just fine. If it doesn't, that's where the problems begin. But let's be optimistic. All right, we have the new three-wire power cord uh, with the chassis securely grounded with a soldered connection and the hot wire wired through the switch and fuse uh, as it should be. The 30 microfarad filter cap and the 10 microfarad cap have been replaced and the fuse is verified to be not only good but also the appropriate 3 amps. And while I was at it I cleaned up the control panel and knobs so that it looks uh, nice and shiny and almost like new. Well we're getting pretty close to where it's time to plug this beast in to see if it works so uh, since it came with no tubes I went into my secret stash in the house of tubes and brought out uh, a reasonably decent tube set here of vintage uh, tubes and install them. So now we're ready to proceed with the circuit check and then finally uh, we'll plug it in and see what happens. Alright, I've gone through and traced the preamp circuit and the phase inverter circuit all the way up to the grids of the 6V6s. Uh, I've changed a couple uh, components that didn't check out right. I've resoldered a couple joints. I've even biased the 6V6s. They do have plate current and plate voltage and they're not well matched. It's 8.3 watts uh, for the left one, 10.7 for the right. But remember I just grabbed these off the shelf. But uh, the values are low enough that they're not going to self incinerate here while uh, we um, do our circuit testing. Now Let's come over here. I've got the signal generator pumping a 500 cycle per second tone into the amp. Let's switch this on. Turn the volume up. Uh, it's at about three quarters. This is in the north. Oh my god. Listen to it. It's trying to oscillate. Now it's quitting. Now we have a good steady tone. Let's see if when we switch to VIB what happens. Wow, listen to that. The tremolo wants to work. Actually, that's the VIB, VIB. Let's see what tremolo, VIB, they sound just the same to me. Now let's try the speed. Wow. Speed works. We've got our tremolo and we've got sort of a weak signal. Notice this is turned up pretty high and it's not exactly blowing the doors out of the workshop. So it appears that we have a working amp with a rather weak output but uh, the tremolo is working, the speed control is working. I think we've accomplished quite a bit today. So I think it's time to call it quits and uh, we'll start again tomorrow. Uh, with a semi working amp. Well it's another great day at Rusty's workshop when the UPS guy delivers a great big heavy box. Let's open it up and see what's inside. 
this big box comes from viewer Albert Martinez and it looks like it's really well packed with all kinds of space on all sides and a nice foam top what I'm seeing is a beautiful wooden cabinet with uh, really nice finger joints so let's get it out of the box and see what we geez I had to use the engine hoist to get it out of the box uh, for its size it's extremely heavy um, the wicker grill looks sort of like a mesa boogie um, let's unwrap it and see what we've got well it looks like what we have here is a legend rock and roll 50 okay it says Celestian speaker it's in pretty good shape the control panels um, clear is starting to flake a little and it looks like a cap backed up to the grill and sprayed the wood is like linseed oil it's like a natural finish I don't see any lacquer or urethane or anything on it and it looks like the ends of the handle are missing let's uh, take this into the workshop put it up on the bench and take a close look well I hoisted it up onto the workbench and found some nice surprises inside first a catnip filled chili pepper for uh, the kitties and then a really nice note from the donor uh, Al Martinez apparently this is a hybrid circuit with 12 AX7 uh, preamp and transistorized output used by some famous people uh, they said it's a relatively lightweight but my back would disagree they say Mesa Boogies uh, weigh around 80 plus pounds. This is probably 35 or 40. And loud, I'll bet it is. Also says it's rather harsh sounding as uh, there is no power section tube buffering. I'm going to guess that a whole bunch of the weight comes from the Rolla Celestian speaker. Obviously 12 inch and 80 watts of uh, power uh, capability with a 50 watt output so you got some safety factor there about 60 percent okay it's a beautiful wood on this thing absolutely gorgeous and it's sort of a natural finish there's no gloss at all to it looks almost like you would rub linseed oil on it the rear control panel um, I have no experience at all with hybrid amp circuits um, but uh, I am willing to learn I think what's uh, going to be the best idea on this is to do some research maybe check out a schematic and try to figure something out uh, as some way to use it in a good practical way let's turn it around and take a look at the front looking in uh, from underneath up at the chassis you can see the power supply with some really stout filter caps output transistors and the preamp section, probably three 12 AX7s. All in all, the construction's just as nice inside the cabinet as out. Very impressive. Well, here's the front view. It looks like the control panel is a little the worse for wear. Whatever they sprayed it with, uh, yellowed and chipped and probably not as durable as it should be maybe a clear lacquer or something of that sort uh, several of the inserts are missing from the knobs it looks like the Mesa type of wicker uh, grill material here I know they sell replacement rolls of it uh, but to me the one overriding and impressive quality is the wood cabinet is absolutely spectacularly made it's gorgeous oak it appears and just magnificent I think uh, as I said I need to do some research on this if the circuit is salvageable uh, maybe go that way or maybe pull this out and put in a all tube circuit take advantage of this gorgeous cabinet and that magnificent speaker and turn it into something else uh, no matter what I think it'll make an interesting project and I want to express my heartfelt gratitude to Al for sending it and the kitties also want to express their gratitude for the catnip filled chili pepper so well, it looks like that red chili pepper is a real hit with Casey look at this well, she loves it 
Well, it looks like Casey really likes that chili pepper, Al. Thanks so much for thinking of her. Well, welcome back. Uh, when last we met, we had a semi-functional amplifier. We had a very low output volume, and we had a tremolo that seemed to want to work, although it was a bit erratic. We also had lots of questions about how this thing used to function and what it functioned with. I really think that the idea that it was an accordion amp and that it was hardwired to plug into an accordion uh, continues to make sense to me. And uh, therefore, I see no reason, since I'm not ever going to use this with an accordion, to persist with the circuit in that form. So what I'm going to do is alter this to work the best that it can with a guitar. I want to create, in effect, a Fender Princeton that has the two 6v6s and a really nice tremolo and has great tone uh, for guitar use. I did all sorts of research on the internet to see if there were any clues uh, about this thing that I needed to know and the only thing I turned up with is where they got the name Lesman which I think is really clever because the two men that started the company Fred Searles and Ralph Studeman took the last three letters from Searles and the last four letters from Studeman. Okay, and that's about all I found that uh, had any relation to our uh, project at hand. And so uh, to accomplish our goal to turn this into a really great sounding Princeton clone uh, we've got several uh, problems that we have to overcome. Number one, the very low volume. We're going to have to find out what's wrong and get this thing to actually, you know, blow the doors out of the workshop. Number two, I think we're going to have to eliminate the UTC uh, line matching transformer from the circuit simply because we don't need it and it probably is going to cause us grief if we leave it in. And number three, we're going to have to come up with some way to have a really great sounding tremolo and hopefully with some sort of intensity control. We already have a speed control, it would be nice to have an intensity control. So with that in mind, let's get started. Step one, we're going to have to have some sort of a quarter inch input jack. Uh, and I think the best place is here. Um, it's away from the power supply and the AC. Um, now, the cabinet comes very close down here, so it's going to have to be right in this area. I thought about down here, but that's kind of up to the front, and there's very little space here between the uh, knob script and the edge of the cabinet. So this is the spot. Okay, now that's going to require that this terminal strip be moved. So let's do that first, then we'll drill a hole and install the input jack. Okay, the terminal strip has been moved from here over here out of harm's way and soldered to the chassis. Um, the remote speaker volume control now is isolated. Um, and not connected in any way so it can't really interfere um, with our circuit plans and now much as I hate to it's time to drill that hole for the input jack. Alright the new quarter inch input jack is in place and not terribly obtrusive I don't think. Uh, now let's uh, go about uh, creating a normal input circuit uh, with a 68k uh, grid stopper and a 1 meg grid leak uh, feeding into the uh, grid of the preamp tube down here, the first 12AX7. And just to reduce any chances of hum, I'm going to use a shielded cable for the connection between the uh, jack and the uh, grid of the 12AX7. The original wiring for the grid pin included a 47k a grid leak resistor which is way too low and was stealing all sorts of volume and a 0.05 microfarad to ground cap which was stealing all sorts of high frequency. Okay with them gone we'll have a fighting chance of getting some decent tone and volume. Okay here's the 68k grid stopper and the 1 meg grid leak. Here's the shielded cable 
running up to the self-grounding input jack. I tested the amp again with the signal generator feeding into our newly uh, created input jack and still had the very low volume uh, condition. Now here's something I don't understand. Look down here the red wire is running from the cathode of the second triode of the preamp tube. Now you see it comes over here and here is a cathode bypass cap going to ground but there is really virtually no connection between that cathode and ground other than the bypass cap. It looks to me like uh, something was cut right here. You see how that it's been cut off? Something else was here. It's been removed and I think it's interfering with the cathode biasing of that second triode. So I'm going to uh, install what I think is an appropriate cathode bias resistor as, and leave the bypass cap in place and we'll see if that doesn't pep things up a little. In fact, the resistance between the cathode of that second triode and ground being the chassis is 275,000 ohms which would effectively shut off that second triode. So let's remove this resistor and install between here and ground uh, a more suitable resistor like what 1500 ohms something like that and see if we can't get that second triode to start working. Okay I have disconnected this resistor from the junction of the cathode wire and the cathode bypass cap. I have then jumpered in a 2.7K bias resistor which is the same value as the other triode used. Uh, this end goes to chassis ground. Now let's turn up the volume and see if we have... Oh yeah! With that second triode working we have plenty of volume. It's louder now at less than a quarter than it was at full volume before. Okay, let's see about our tremolo. Ugh. The speed's working, but the intensity is not working on our tremolo. So, you close one door and another one opens here. Okay, so now we've got to hunt down the reason for the tremolo failure. Since we have no tremolo now, uh, to speak of, what if we input the signal from the oscillator directly into that junction where the wire comes from the cathode of the second triode and goes to the bias resistor and the bypass cap. Okay, here is the output from the oscillator um, and I'll turn this to normal. We'll turn it up. Now let me turn it to tremolo. Wow. Our tremolo's back. It's pretty intense though. It may even be chopping notes. So, you know what I'm thinking? What if I used this remote speaker pot as an intensity control for the tremolo? I'm going to hook it up that way and see if it works, okay? This, I think, is a little too intense right now. Okay, I'm hooked up here. Let me turn this down a little so you can hear me better. Now, it works, but the resistance is too great in the pot. The response is too sudden. So, uh, let me check the resistance of this pot and maybe replace it. Uh, with a much lower value potentiometer so we can have a gradual adjustment of our intensity. Okay, that was about a 500k pot and I measured the kind of sweet spot on it was about a 100k. So I switched to a 100k potentiometer and listen now to see what you think of our control range. Maximum intensity. Down to minimum. 
I still hear a little bit of oscillation, but I don't think it's too bad, and that's only when the tremolo switch is on. Okay, so I'm going to install the 100K pot, and uh, we'll start using it as our intensity control for the tremolo. Now let's just... Now let's discuss step one in removing the UTC transformer from our signal pathway. Our guitar signal will come in our newly created input jack and input circuit to the grid of the first triode of the 12AX7 preamp tube. Exits from the plate, passes through a 0.01 microfarad coupling cap, and then goes into the grid of its companion triode. This is the triode that we saw earlier, had the 275,000 ohms of bias resistance, but it is now working properly. The signal will then pass from the plate of the second triode and travel up here through a 47K resistor, a 0.02 microfarad uh, coupling cap, and then go into the UTC transformer and then on to the volume control. Uh, the resistance across pin 1 and pin 4 of that UTC transformer I think <clears throat> needs to be supplemented and by experimentation I found that a 470K resistor uh, provides some really nice tone as a substitution for the UTC transformer. Uh, let's hook up a guitar here. I'll strum a few chords and we're going to verify that the volume control works properly with this arrangement and that the tone and uh, volume are uh, appropriate. Okay, the uh, amp is plugged in, turned on. We're picking up some hum here from the exposed wires that I have here in the uh, input circuit. I think you'll find if once I shield those that uh, the hum will go away. Let me just play a few chords and we'll see how it sounds. We're at one quarter volume. Well both the volume and tone are absolutely spectacular I think. It has wonderful bass and nice clear treble. Let me go up to about one third volume. Nice noticeable increase in volume uh, and I think the tone is absolutely spectacular from this thing. I'm astounded. Okay, now we've verified that this circuit arrangement works. You can see how more it, it hums a little louder when I get close to it. I'm going to hardwire that with shielded cable, cut out the hum, and then we're going to work on getting the tremolo to work with uh, this circuit. All right, I've hardwired in that a modification where we bypass the UTC transformer. Uh, let's verify now, first, that the hum has subsided to acceptable levels, and secondly, that we still have our tone and volume. Okay, to me it still sounds wonderful. Now let's start working on the tremolo. Here we have the circuitry for the tremolo oscillator. And here is the output from the cathode of the uh, 12AX7 oscillator tube. We see that it comes over here and connects to this outer lug on the norm vib trem switch. Now when you turn the switch to either vib or trem, this uh, lug here is connected to this lug and will have an output along this wire. What I suggest is that we uh, take that wire and attach it to the uh, cathode of the second 12AX7. I'm going to show you in the circuit my little drawing what we're doing. As you recall from our previous circuit tracing, we ended up here at the volume control. 
then uh, we would exit from the uh, wiper of the volume control through a 470k ohm resistor down here through a shielded cable to the grid of the third there's first, second, third triode. What I advocate then is we're going to tie in our tremolo output right here to the cathode of this tube and see how it sounds. Okay, there is the uh, switchable output from the tremolo oscillator. I trace it around here. It's the black wire right down there. I've connected a red wire to it. And I have jumpered between there and the cathode of the third triode. Let's turn on the trim and see what it sounds like. Well, it's definitely working. It's just way too strong. You hear that loud thump. So let's attenuate its signal a bit with resistance and see if we can get it down to where it doesn't thump noticeably but still produces a pleasing tremolo effect. I ran the switchable tremolo output uh, directly to the cathode of the third uh, triode and even with a, a 250k volume control uh, it just didn't work right. Uh, either it was uh, overpowering or it just went away. So I'm going to try a second approach and that is to split the output and feed it to the grids of the two 6v6 output tubes. Okay, let me hook that up and let's see how that works. Here's a diagram of what I'm planning to try. We have the tremolo output going through that rotating uh, tremolo vib switch. Uh, when it's closed, the tremolo output will go to the center tap of a 250K pot. We give it two choices. At low intensity settings, the tremolo output will go to ground. At higher intensity settings, it will come through a 100K resistor to the grids of the two 6V6 output tubes. Uh, now, uh, let's see how that works. After a whole bunch of experimentation, this is what I ended up with on the tremolo wiring. This is a brand new 250K pot, which has been uh, put into the remote speaker volume position. The left-hand lug is grounded. The center lug or wiper receives the switched output from the oscillator uh, of the tremolo and the right hand lug comes over here through a 100k resistor to the grid of one of the two 6v6's. Now I know what you're thinking, why not both grids? Well, when I do that regardless of how much resistance I put in, the result is a distorted mess. Okay, but with the uh, way that it's wired right now into the right-hand grid, the result is as nice a tremolo as I've ever heard. So that's the way I'm going, okay? I don't, I'm not really completely able to explain it, but it works. All right, let's have a final uh, check of all of the circuit changes that have been done on this circuit. The amp is turned on. Uh, there is no tremolo turned on at the moment. I've got the volume at about one quarter. Okay, the tone and volume have not been compromised at all by the changes. Let me switch to tremolo and uh, we have the intensity control at the minimum. Alright, now let's crank the intensity control up about a third. Let's go up to a half or a little over a half. And we'll go WFO. Okay, so we can adjust from actually too much 
to no tremolo with our intensity control. So I would uh, say that the rewiring was a total success. Oh, let's try the speed. I forgot about that. We'll go up here about a little less than half. Speed works fine. I feel that uh, the modifications have been very successful. This amp has a fantastic tone. Very warm, uh, good strong bass, but you still clear on top. The tremolo seems to work as well as any tremolo I've heard, okay, from too much to none, uh, which is the way the controls should work. So uh, I think it's time to focus on the cabinet, get it all cleaned up so that it's up to the standards of the uh, newly wired chassis and then we'll put it all together and have a final sound check. Well step one in cleaning up the cabinet is to vacuum out the floor of it. Uh, a little bit of uh, rodent residue and this one not bad though uh, and then I washed the floor and sterilized it and the rest of the cabinet inside looks just fine. Cleaned up the speaker and now we can address our tension to the rather wretched external uh, parts of the cabinet which the Tolex looks great. This is really stout covering material but uh, it has a deep grain that really holds the dirt. So let's get started. First I spray on a bunch of that Car Guys Super Cleaner and then I work it down into all the little crevices uh, with a toothbrush. Then I wipe it all off and next apply some uh, Armor All uh, to sort of soften and preserve the vinyl cover. The result is a nice glossy surface, probably much like it was when it was new. Now let's do the other side and the top and of course the bottom. As usual, the top is going to be the biggest challenge. Uh, but uh, here's a before picture and we'll be back in just a second with the after. And here's the end result, nice and glossy and just clean as can be. I left a couple little white specks up here just to make it official. Well, that's the last side. I also did the back, of course. And uh, I think, honestly, it cleaned up to look probably pretty much like it did when it was new. Okay, so now let's reinstall the chassis and uh, wire up the speaker and then we'll be ready for uh, some audio testing. As you can see, it's all going back together real well. I even uh, ran a screw back here through the cabinet to support the heavy uh, power transformer. Um, cabinet is immaculate inside and out. Got some strain relief over here on the new three-wire power cord. And the speaker leads are soldered in place. Uh, now it's time to install that upper back door. I filled that hole uh, with fiberglass and I've started trying to match the grain and color of the uh, covering material. Uh, so that's not finished yet, but sure looks better than a gaping hole. Okay, let's get this installed now. And here's the amplifier uh, completely assembled. Inside and outside are immaculate. Got a strain relief over here on the cord and the parts that I removed, of course, in a little bag on the bottom. Let's take a look at the control panel. Looking nice and clean. And I also made a tremolo intensity uh, label here instead of remote speaker volume. Okay, and there, of course, is a quarter inch input jack. Handle cleaned up real nice. Top looks great. Let's turn it around and take a look at the... And here's the full frontal view. Looking pretty much like new. Uh, so I think all that's left now is to get Ollie and Jack up from their catnap and have them strum a few chords to this jewel so we can see how it sounds. Okay, now we have the mighty Lessman out here uh, up on the workbench and all back together. 
and we've got Ollie and Jack just gnashing at their whiskers to uh, play us a few tunes. Okay, so let's see what you think of how the Lessman sounds. <laughs> Now let's try the tremolo, uh, the one that in which I added the intensity uh, control, and see what you think. <laughs> I guess that about does it for this video on the mighty 1963 Lessman Echo Amp. I hope you enjoyed it and liked the way it turned out and that you will join a Jack and Casey and Ollie and me for future videos. I also want to thank my Patreon patrons and PayPal contributors for keeping us on the air for another month advertising free. Uh, if any of you would like to join them, I will have links in the video description uh, that will enable you to do so. Also, if you would like to contribute a used gear, like this amp was contributed uh, to be used uh, to make uh, future videos, uh, please contact me and uh, we can make arrangements uh, for that donation to occur. So with all that said, I wanted to thank you all again for watching and subscribing. And we look forward to seeing you again in the near future. Bye for now.